Good afternoon, this is Dr. Havens. I would like to welcome you to the NUR 2801C Nursing Roles and Leadership course. Our week one lesson plan will focus on chapters one, two, and three of our textbook, Essentials of Nursing Leadership and Management by Weiss et al, the seventh edition. Let's jump on in to chapter one. We are gonna be talking about the characteristics of a profession and in particular nursing as a profession. These are a few of the objectives that we're gonna be working with this evening in tonight's class. We will be discussing professional behaviors and characteristics that are associated with professions in general and more specifically with the nursing profession. We will talk about licensure and certification for professional nurses. We will discuss some of the issues that are faced today by the nursing profession and talk about current changes going on that impact nursing. And we will also take a look at social change in the United States over the past few decades and how this has led to um, the advancement of nursing as a profession. Let's talk for just a couple of minutes about the concept of professionalism and what this means for nursing. In the beginning, nursing started out as a vocation or a calling. Mostly it was practiced um, in the form of a charitable or altruistic calling, um, sometimes religious. Before Florence Nightingale, most nursing took place through religious orders. Florence Nightingale was the first nursing theorist and is described as the mother of secular nursing. She um, helped move nursing more toward a profession and to become more scientific. So one aspect of a profession is that it has its own body of knowledge and that in order to gain entrance into the profession, people have to engage in specialized education and training such as our ASDN nursing curriculum. So after students graduate from their nursing program, they um, are confirmed by successfully passing the NCLEX or the National Council Licensure Exam, and then they receive a license to practice that is issued by the state in which they live and practice, um, and it's issued by the State Board of Nursing. So nurses are expected to follow a code of ethics and recognize practice standards based on um, the latest research and information that informs and directs our practice. This changes over time, and we're going to talk about this a little bit tonight about how things have changed in the 30-something years that I've been practicing nursing. So nurses function autonomously as professionals by the virtue of our license. We have our own nursing license. We're not working under a doctor's license or under any other type of professional. And we work within a designated scope of practice that's defined by the Nurse Practice Act in each state. We um, autonomously formulate and deliver a nursing care plan for our clients. We apply nursing judgment, and we use our critical thinking skills in decision-making and delivering patient care. So some of the characteristics or behaviors that we expect from nurses are being considerate, being empathic and respectful, using sound and ethical values, having good morals, being accountable for, accountable for our behavior, being committed to lifelong learning, we um, continually take CEU courses and um, keep our knowledge base current. We um, are expected as professionals to put our needs aside for those of our patients, and we expect nurses to be. Nursing professionals are expected to carry out our nursing duties while being ethical and also um, being fair and culturally sensitive to taking care of patients from diverse backgrounds. We are expected to communicate courteously and effectively within our work environment. We are expected to old, uphold certain levels of behavior as registered nurses, both in our professional and our personal lives. Um, nurses can actually lo lose their licenses for a variety of reasons or actions that are deemed professional or illegal by a state board of nursing, even though it may not um, relate to, directly to our job. For instance, um, inappropriate use of social media, um, such as posting 
emotionally charged statements or something politically inappropriate in a blog or on a public forum can get a nurse into trouble and be subject to disciplinary action. Um, doing illegal things like driving without a valid driver's license or maybe committing a felony can actually cause suspension or revocation of a nursing license. We expect nurses to be committed to others as kind of a central tenet of our profession. And this also implies a commitment to our colleagues as well, not just to patients and their families. We are committed to lifelong learning through the continuing education process, and we are also committed to accountability for our own actions. So what does professionalism mean? Um, back in the day when I was a student, we hadn't really clearly defined this. So professionalism was kind of like um, if your uniform and your shoes were clean and if you were pleasant and polite, that kind of took care of it all. This was in the day before we knew a whole lot about nurse incivility or emotional intelligence or a whole lot of things that go into defining what professionalism is in the 21st century. So what does it mean? It could mean coming to work on time, showing up for your colleagues when scheduled. Um, if you come in late, it kind of shows disrespect to your peers and your patients and your colleagues. They want to go home on time and they're depending on you to get there and relieve them as you would want them to do for you. And it also kind of shows people that maybe your position isn't so important to you. Professionalism also involves always trying to keep a positive attitude. I mean, keep in mind that this is a journey and not a destination. We all fall short of this, certainly myself included. Everyone has a bad day. Um, try to keep your personal feelings and issues out of the work environment and just try to be there and be your very best self um, for your patients and your colleagues and everyone involved. So most healthcare organizations where we practice have dress codes. Um, try to dress appropriately per your employer's expectations. Um, some things like heavy makeup, heavy cologne, or um, some inappropriate hairstyles may indicate a lack of professionalism or at least be perceived that way by your supervisor or the people that you work with. Um, speaking professionally is very important to everybody in the work environment. A good rule to follow would be if you wouldn't say it in front of your grandmother, please don't say it in the workplace. So um, workplace politics can sometimes create a really difficult environment. We've all been in this situation where there's someone who um, didn't see things quite the way we do, or maybe, you know, we weren't treated as fairly as we had hoped. You want to not engage in a lot of workplace politics if possible. Stay away from gossiping, negative comments. Um, try to keep things positive. Negativity can really be contagious and affect morale, and you don't want that. Um, we all need to work together and stay positive as much as possible. Focus on the positive aspects of the job. You want to maintain a positive attitude anytime you're in the work environment. Um, if the environment is such that you can't be positive most of the time, and the way I would define this in practical terms is there have to be more good days than bad on your job. If your attitude is suffering and you're having more bad days than good, it may be time to look for another position because it's more important to maintain a positive outlook. Um, you don't want this to affect your own mental health. Lastly, professional behavior entails being honest and accountable. If you need a day off, tell your supervisor and take a personal vacation day. Please don't call in sick. Save your sick days for when you're really ill. Um, if you make a mistake, it's, it's very hard for us to admit this sometimes, but if you make a mistake, please be honest and own up to it. People will trust you more that way than if they find out later that you made a mistake and that you covered it up or were not forthright about it. In nursing, our errors can result in um, injury or even death to a client, and we don't want this. So our healthcare environment has to promote a culture of patient safety and also safety in which a nurse can report 
freely um, a, an error that was made without fear of punishment for having made that error. So let's spend a few minutes looking at the evolution of nursing as a profession. In 1859, Florence Nightingale defined the goal of nursing as putting the client in the best possible condition for nature to act upon him or her. She was the first person to scientifically document the positive effects of nursing care on restoring a sick client to health. She focused on um, cleanliness and hygiene, good food and nutrition, fresh air, and just the basics that were needed to fight infection and to help patients get better. So fast forward about a hundred years, about a century, nursing theorist Virginia Henderson focused her definition on the uniqueness of nursing. What makes nursing different from um, just typical woman's duties was the, the thinking of the day. How do we carve out ourselves as um, and our identity as professionals? And she described this as the unique function of the nurse is to assist the individual, sick or well, in the performance of activities that contribute to health or its recovery. So um, nursing is any activity that helps a sick patient get well. And Virginia's theory also focuses just a little bit on health promotion and preventative care. How do we help people stay well who are currently well and prevent illness and um, getting sick? And then about 20 years after that, nursing theorist Martha Rogers defined professional nursing practice as the process by which the body of knowledge, nursing science, is used for the purpose of assisting human beings to achieve maximum health within each person's potential. And I just love that. I think it's beautiful. So in the 21st century modern nursing, nurses are viewed as collaborative members of the healthcare team. Nursing has emerged as a field. We've kind of come to our own with a wide range of responsibilities and behaviors for which we hold ourselves accountable. Recent polls show that nurses are considered to be among the most trusted groups of professionals because of our knowledge, expertise, and our ability to care for diverse populations. I think in 2015, a survey done by Forbes magazine showed that Nurses were the second most trusted group of professionals, second only to ministers. And to the best of my recollections, um, I'm not even sure that physicians made the top 10 groups of trusted professionals in the United States. So this is um, important to realize the impact that we have on our clients and their families and the trust that they place in us. We are there with them. Uh, when clients are sick and frail, when they're giving birth, and even at the moment of their death, and they um, trust us a lot, and this is very important. So there have been several important historical milestones that have come about to advance the nursing profession. In 1935, the Social Security Act was passed, a federal law that allows for what they called old people's insurance, or what we think of as social security payments that um, people in our country draw if they have worked um, a certain number of years for a living in the US. And as you know, um, the people, nobody's getting rich off social security. The best that we can hope for is it supplements some other retirement source or pension. Um, some of our elders are only drawing a few hundred dollars a month, but hey, at least it's enough to cover the groceries or the power bill maybe. So Social Security is an entitlement program. Everybody who lives and works in the U.S. is entitled to this when they reach a certain age. And the Social Security Act, this federal law, set the stage for um, the beginning of both Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare and Medicaid came out of the Social Security Act law, and they both came into existence 30 years after Social Security in 1965. Please forgive my scratchy voice this afternoon, guys. I forgot to take my Zyrtec today and I have an allergy thing going on. I'm so sorry. So Medicare and Medicaid both came about in my lifetime. I was a little kid when my grandparents were alive and got their Medicare cards in 1965. 
prior to this, if someone became ill and they needed to go to the hospital, either they paid out of pocket or it was assumed that the community would support the hospital. Um, local municipalities, local governments would pay money to the hospital to take care of people who couldn't pay. Um, so sometimes there was money to run the hospital, sometimes maybe there wasn't. So sometimes patients who were indigent couldn't get care in the hospital and they had to be cared for at home with the doctor coming and making house rounds. Um, basically, if the community could su not support the local hospital or if a religious order was not paying for it, such as Baptist hospitals or Catholic supported hospitals, then um, if patients couldn't afford care, then basically they died. So um, with Medicare and Medicaid or with Medicare, everyone 65 and older could get their hospitalizations paid for. Um, and this was a tremendous boon to the nursing profession. This meant more people were being admitted to the hospital. There was hospital growth and therefore more nursing jobs. And then Medicaid came about. It's a federal program that's administered by the state. So each of the 50 states has a different Medicaid program. But, and this is indigent care basically. And coverage for Medicaid varies from state to state. Um, as you know, based on the Affordable Care Act, um, some states have expanded Medicaid so that everyone in the state can have coverage and some states such as Florida have not. But just the fact that we got Medicaid in 1965 helped the nursing profession, helped us grow professionally, provided more services, um, led to more hospitals, more care, more technology and better nursing care. Similarly, um, some things that have kind of gone on in, in um, the social and political realm have advanced the nursing profession over the years. The Civil Rights Act in the 1960s, um, women's rights in the 1970s, all advanced the nursing profession. Um, it raised our status since we are still, the nursing profession in the US is about 90% women even now. Um, and it helped with better wages and helped nurses to be respected more as professionals. Um, so things that happen in the political arena can affect nursing. So it's good to be politically aware and be aware of what's going on in social change. Nurses are about 1% of the voting population in the US and that doesn't sound like much, but that's actually huge. We can change things politically. Also some wars in recent decades, um, Korea and Vietnam um, kind of helped with a lot of nursing jobs. A lot of nurses were able to serve in the military for the first time um, and advance their military careers. A lot of technology came about because of these wars, especially in terms of medical technology, surgical techniques, medical equipment, advances in medication to help care for wounded soldiers. The government always provide, provides a lot of good funding during wartime, and this helped to advance our profession as well. And as we know, emerging pathogens and new diseases impact nursing as well. Um, I saw my first HIV patient when I was a nursing student in 1984. After I was a nurse practitioner, I remember writing my first prescription for AZT, one of the very early HIV meds, I think in 1992. So um, this opened up doors for a lot of jobs for nurses and nurse practitioners. And in more recent years, we have Zika virus, we have Ebola, and now we have COVID-19. So whatever's going on in the world in terms of em um, emerging pathogens, we need to stay current on all that with our continuing education as this greatly impacts our profession. I want to talk just real quickly, just a brief moment about the NCLEX exam. So this is, everyone in here has taken an NCLEX to become a licensed practical nurse and upon graduation, you're going to sit for your NCLEX RN to become a registered nurse. Um, the NCLEX is owned by the National Council of State Boards of Nursing located in Chicago. Your license will be issued by the Florida Board of Nursing. In recent years, the interstate compact has opened up a lot of possibilities for nurses to get a multi-state license so that if you move or do travel nursing or um, 
other things, it's just easier to become licensed in, in more than one state. That can be very beneficial for a lot of reasons. Currently, I think 33 states recognize the interstate compact and the multi-state license. If you want to move or practice in another state that does not have the interstate compact, then you'll have to apply for a license through that state. So it's a little bit more cumbersome. Let's say you love Florida, you love being down here during the winter when there's no snow, but you've decided it's just too hot in the summer and maybe um, during the summer months you'd like to go north and practice nursing in New Hampshire or Vermont where it's um, uh, the temperature is a little bit more reasonable, not so hot and humid. If those aren't compact states, then you have to apply th through either of those state boards of nursing and get a license in that state as well. So what qualifies one to become an RN? Basically, after graduation from an approved nursing program, um, you'll be able to sit for the NCLEX RN, and we are state approved, and we are um, accredited by the ASIN, the Accrediting Commission on Education in Nursing. So after graduation, you will sit for the NCLEX RN. Um, we will talk more about this in future weeks. We are going to invite Ms. Orender to come and spend the better part of an evening with us going over specifically how to register and get prepared for the NCLEX RN. Um, the NCLEX RN is based on a test plan that's updated by the National Council every three years, and we are currently under the 2019 test plan. So nursing is an aging profession. The average age of nurses in the U.S. is over 40, and um, approximately 50% of men and women that are in the nursing work workforce are older than 50. So this is a challenge. It's estimated that more than 400,000 new nurses will be needed by the year 2024. So as an RN, you will have a lot of job security. You will never be without a position. You will always have work that you want and that you love. There are some generational issues in the workforce. Um, older people like me, I'm a baby boomer. We tend to have different personality characteristics than say millennials and some younger people. Um, my generation is all about being dependable and fulfilling your duty and not asking questions. And um, millennials are sometimes anything but. If a rule doesn't make sense to them or if they can see a way to do something better, they don't simply want to follow the rules. They want to change the system. So this is great, but it can sometimes cause interger intergenerational conflict within the workplace, and it can be quite interesting. Then one other point I want to make about professional nursing behavior is that it always requires respect and integrity as well as providing um, safe nursing practice. So professionalism in nursing is somewhat about what we do, but also who we are. I'd like to say just a couple of words about the advancement of the nursing profession due to the need of the general public for more healthcare providers. A report that came out around 2010 by the IOM or the Institute of Medicine that's now known, actually they've changed their name to the National Academy of Medicine, specifically calls for nurses to be able to practice to the full extent of their education. As you may know, nurse practitioners can um, practice independently in about 30 states. This includes all advanced practice nurses, including certified nurse midwives and nurse anesthetists, in addition to nurse practitioners. Florida is transitioning to an independent state based on a law that was just passed earlier this year in 2020. There is a path to independence, a set of steps that you have to fulfill with the Board of Nursing before you can work as a nurse practitioner without a protocol in Florida. So we're getting there. In order to be an advanced practice nurse, um, you are required to have a master's degree in nursing with a clinical focus such as pediatrics, geriatrics, family practice, or psychiatry. And many states are advocating for nurse practitioners to um, have a doctorate degree as the entry level for practice, such as a PhD in nursing or either a DNP, doctorate of nursing practice degree. 
I want to do just a couple of quick review questions for this chapter. The first question is, which of the following represent the knowledge and skills expected of registered nurses? Is it advocacy, autonomy, accountability, or all of the above? And the answer is D. All of these are expected of registered nurses. And the other review question is, Professional accountability serves which of the following purposes? Is it to convince your patients to make the right decision? Are you accountable to provide a, as a, providing a basis for ethical decision making in your nursing care? Or are you accountable to by belonging to a professional organization such as the American Nurses Association or the Florida Nurses Association? or none of the above? And the answer to this question is B, professional accountability serves to provide a basis for ethical decision-making because we want our practice to be ethical, have high integrity, and to be highly respected by all of our patients.